In this, the second, the final part of our look at dynamic memory allocation, we're going to briefly touch upon the idea of garbage collection and uh, then follow it up with a little look at, at object pools. In terms of garbage collection, now it is actually a feature that C++ doesn't have. Um, so it may be a little bit curious in terms of exploration of C++ looking at it. So this is a feature that Java, that's C Sharp, managed languages have. And in C++, we don't have it. We need to basically do or to manage garbage collection ourselves. By garbage collection, what we're referring to is cleaning up uh, old objects, discarded objects, objects that are not wanted or needed anymore. So we'll create objects uh, or arrays or data as we go through our, our program, the normal process, and we have to remember to delete them, to free them up whenever we finish with them, to release the memory that they had otherwise been uh, holding on to. That's what we mean with the process of garbage collection. In managed languages, is one of their strengths that you don't have to bother about that, that I and you and even can create objects in, in Java. Uh, just bring them into existence, use them, and ignore them. And whenever they go out of scope, or whenever the references to those objects go out of scope, the garbage collector will eventually get around to freeing up the, the memory. So it is a managed language because the process of, of allocating, of deallocating these objects is managed for us. It's, it's a run on the virtual machine basically as a low priority thread that occasionally will kick in look through, work out what objects are can be freed up and then free them up as we go along. In C++, it's up to us, the programmer, to do that. Um, now, there are swings and roundabouts to this. It, it is a big plus if you're using Java not, have to, not to have to do this because it means then you can focus on thinking about higher level things about what are you trying to accomplish, not getting bogged down with low level um, implementation details. The downside, or the potential downside, so it is actually one that can be avoided. And this is the big plus in this. It's, it's rare to have in computing a notion of a win-win. There's always a trade-off. Um, but in this case, we can have a win-win. Now, the downside, potential downside of a garbage collection is you take it for granted. You don't um, sort of, you, you assume that it does its job and there's no cost to doing this job. There is a cost to doing this job and it can be quite considerable. But as long as you know this is the case and you write your managed code in a way that will not inadvertently or inappropriately put a large burden onto the garbage collector, then you can let it look after the object creation and you can think about things in a higher level so you can get the best of both worlds. But to get there, I want to sort of have a, a small delve into roughly how garbage collection works, how we might want to implement this if we were doing it within C++, things we get for free, for example, within Java. And then briefly at the end of this to look at some other ways which we can help mitigate the cost associated with garbage collection. There are multiple different uh, techniques that can be used to doing this. I'm, I'm only picking one here, it's called Martin Sweeps, one of the more common ones. So this, this, the bigger picture for here is that if you have a heap and you've got a bunch of algorithms that are managing the heap, you'll want to have some that can work out where you want to allocate memory. You'll need to have some algorithms maybe that'll partition and, and move memory about to make sure you have large free chunks. You'll also want other algorithms like the one we're looking at here to, to manage freeing up um, old objects that are not used anymore on the heap. So that's the process of garbage collection. Common one, mark and sweep. It's a very, very simple approach. It basically assumes that you have two lists um, or managed lists that are being managed when you're executing your program. You have one list that stores all of the objects that have been allocated on the heap. So you, you know all the things you've allocated, got a big long list of them. You'll have a second list of all of the pointers, uh, the references, the things that point to, to objects notionally within your, your program. And the, the, the mark phase is that you're going down through this list, you're looking at each reference, each pointer, and you're saying, well, do you point to something that's currently allocated on the, on the heap? And if it does, you put a tick, so to speak, next to that object. You, you mark that object and you say, ah, there's somebody that's referring to you. You do that for all of your, your pointers. 
Having done that, you then know which objects on your heap somebody's referring to and also objects nobody's referring to if you haven't marked them. So that's when the sweep bit comes in. So you sweep down through your list of objects on the heap. If you find one that isn't referred to by any pointers or other references or things like that, you remove it. It's not used anymore. It can be safely um, discarded. So it gives you a chance then to free it up. Now, in, in languages like Java, that, that'll be a background process that runs, it does this on, on our behalf to clean things up. If you wanted to implement something like this in C++, then I'm going to give you a brief overview, one tip way of going about doing that. Two phases to this, we've got some design decisions we want to make, and then there's some implementation runtime decisions that we'll need to do. In terms of the design decisions, you can see two requirements at the top. Require all created objects to extend a common base class, e.g. let's call it object. Now, that's actually the case within Java, within C Sharp, that even if you create your own user-defined class, it implicitly, if you're not explicit about it, it implicitly extends a superclass called object. All objects do. Uh, now, that's good. It means then that you have a base class where you can embed some functionality within it. And for example, that would include things you know, in Java, like the toString method. You can go to any method and have a toString. That's one of the things that's provided through the base object class, or the ability to get a hash uh, code or key associated with a, a value. Equally, something that we can mark. Um, also, alongside that, we, we don't want to have raw arrays because then we can't easily mark them. We would take any arrays that we have wrap them up within an object. So we'll have an object that contains a raw array. In doing that, we can also then mark that array as well. And again, that's what happens within, for example, Java, that you don't have raw arrays. If you create an array, effectively, it is being wrapped up within an object. And the raw, the chunk of memory, is, is one of the properties within that object. Um, beyond this, we shouldn't also use raw pointers. So we want to use reference counting, smart pointers. Doing that then is going to make it more easy to work out what things we're pointing to, what things nothing's pointing to. So by introducing those design time decisions, we, we can set up a C++ project uh, in, in a manner where we can easily implement a, a sort of a, a mark and sweep approach. At runtime, then we would have to have some process that would decide every once in a while. And the big question is, how often should this be? Um, and, and a lot of, for example, say Java environments, it is a low priority thread. If there isn't a lot going on, then the thread will kick into to action. It'll go through and it'll clean things up. It may only work every once in a while. But there's big balancing factors here. They actually do have a, pair, a bearing upon games. Um, if you only do your, your, your garbage collection every once in a while, so you're not doing it that often, it means that the amount of work at each time you do this is likely to be great. So it'll take more time. And if you're doing a game, that actually can introduce a perceivable pause, you can skip a frame. If you do it more frequently, so there you're only removing a few objects each time, it makes it smoother, but you also have more overhead because you're running this thing frequently and you're going through the algorithms frequently. So there is a, a trade-off between frequency and the cost then of each uh, garbage collection when it happens. Anyway, runtime, we have to have some bases that'll kick off a thread that'll go through, it'll do the marking and do the sweeping at some defined schedule or some defined frequency. Now, hopefully, looking at this here, you can appreciate that all of this doesn't come for free. It takes a fair amount of time and effort to, for it to happen. But this is what happens in managed languages. And it's provided for us, but we should not take it for granted. That's the important bit. Um, the advantages using garbage collection, they include no memory leaks in principle because it's managed for us. And it frees us up from a rather low-level, boring thing that we probably don't want to be bothered with, thinking about what it is we're trying to achieve in terms of the code. We're thinking at a higher level. Downside, the key disadvantage is that if I have um, a method that I'm calling frequently, so lots and lots of times a second, maybe the method doesn't do that much. But if within that method, I allocate a couple of objects that live on the heap, and at the end of the method, those objects are then discarded, the method itself may only be doing a little bit in terms of CPU cycles, 
but the process of allocating and deallocating can be hundreds of times more uh, CPU cycles needed there. So we want to be careful anytime we have a frequently occurring method, anytime that involves creation of an object, we don't want to create lots of very short-lived objects. That will provide the garbage collector with a very large burden and it will kill any chance we have of getting a nice fast uh, performing program. So as long as we can recognize those situations and we can put in place take measures to avoid those situations, we can have the best of both worlds. We can think at high level and we can avoid inadvertently introducing large performance problems. How do you, if, if, if you if you do have something that has to be frequently called that needs to make use of temporary objects each time you go around it, well, what do we do in that situation? There are common solutions for these. And an object pool is one of the more commonly used ones. It's quite nice. Um, how does an object pool work? And you can see an analogy of it here. Um, so for example, if you're going into a bowling alley uh, where you need particular footwear, they will have a collection of, of, of shoes available. And they will then lend you out a pair of shoes, which you can use. When you've finished with them, you then hand them back and they're put into the pool available for reuse. It's exactly the same notion. If you have a method that's going to be frequently called that needs a certain collection of, of objects to be available, then create a pool of them at the start. Uh, Any time you need that, you go to your container and you say, well, can you lend me an object? You take the object, when you're finished with it, you go back to the pool and you say, well, okay, I've, I've finished with it, you can now release that to something else. So effectively, it, evolves, it avoids the notion of temporary objects being created. We create a set of them that persist throughout the program and we borrow them and return them. Uh, so it changes the emphasis on the object, it has to go and ask for them, it has to remember to say it's finished with them, to give them back, but that's fair enough. You can do lots of fancy things in terms of how you allocate these. You can have dynamic processes, that if you've notionally given out all of your, your, your shoes, you can magic up some new ones by creating some new objects and add additional ones to the pool. So it's a very flexible uh, means of, um, of, of managing short-lived objects. And we can use an object pool really in any language, and we should do, uh, when we have a lot of temporary objects that need to be created and reused and are short-lived. Overall takeaways on this, um, so unlike C Sharp, unlike Java, C++, there's no automatic garbage collection. Programmer has to do it. If you don't do it and you don't do it right, you'll have memory leaks coming in. That's a bad thing. Uh, to do it right, it does take uh, time and effort if you want to be sophisticated about it, as opposed to just remembering to always to, to delete and to free things up. Um, there is a danger memory leak if we don't do this properly. Other key takeaway in this is just to appreciate the amount of time and effort, algorithmically speaking, is needed to do this. Uh, it is a significant cost. We shouldn't take it for granted. And if we think, no, this is too high a cost, we want to draw upon things like object pools as a way of mitigating that creation and, and deletion cost. So we can incur it only once at startup and then once at the end.